thank you all for coming today. It's a real pleasure to see you in person. I'm going to talk today about aero engines and steam turbine. This is the Trent engine that goes on the big civil aircraft. And you see that there are a number of materials in there. There's the aluminum alloy, a thin sliver of aluminum alloy on the casing. Then there's the titanium blades uh, in the front of the engine. These are massive blades, which basically are driven by the shaft to provide the thrust of the engine. And the thing that drives the shaft is the combustion of fuel in this region here, where the temperature reaches 1500 degrees centigrade and we would like to go even higher but at the moment there aren't the materials to sustain higher temperatures purely because we want to increase the efficiency of the engine so titanium cannot survive at these sorts of temperatures in fact uh, you never use titanium alloys beyond around 500 degrees centigrade because if there's some rubbing of titanium against some other metal then you have a flash fire and the entire engine is gutted out. Okay, so there's a fire line at around 500 degrees centigrade beyond which we use nickel based alloys. Uh, nickel based alloys are actually operating at temperatures which are above their melting temperature. Okay, so those blades, the red blades that you see, are operating in a regime where the temperature is above the melting temperature. So, how do you do that? Well, there's, there's sort of cooling channels within the blades, uh, which pump air at 600 degrees centigrade through the blade to keep it cool. And they have very special coatings on the surface called thermal barrier coatings, which stop the blades from uh, absorbing too much heat. I want you to focus on this central component here, which is the shaft. Uh, the shaft drives these uh, drives the entire turbine around and is a critical component. Uh, it reaches temperatures of the order of four to 500 degrees centigrade because again, we have oil cooling in that region. So, just to give you an example of the size of the blades that I'm going to talk about, I took this picture yesterday. Uh, this is the fan blade right at the front of the engine, and you can compare against my height here. And my plan was to bring this blade in today, but I gave up very quickly after feeling the weight of the blade. And although it's made out of titanium, which has a density of just 4.7 grams per centimeter cubed, uh, it is actually hollow. Uh, it has a honeycomb center, which you see in the top right uh, corner made just like you make corrugated cardboard right but it's made by a process called diffusion bonding and there's approximately 30 of these blades at the front of the engine going at around you know two to three thousand revolutions per minute so imagine what would happen if that blade breaks while the engine is running okay? so the momentum per blade is such that you could throw a car to a height of 100 meters if that blade breaks. Now, obviously that is a, a dangerous uh, scenario. So we don't want the blade to break, but you know, accidents will happen. So what we've got to do is to contain that blade within the engine, because if, it, if debris leaves the engine, then it hits the fuselage and then you're in trouble. Okay, the aircraft usually goes down if that happens. So this is an experiment which costs about 15 million pounds to run, but it's designed to see what would happen when a blade fails, right? And it's called a containment test where you have an explosive charge put at the root of the blade, and then the engine is started, and when it reaches its full velocity, you blow up the blade, and see what happens. In this test, a small explosive charge is used to release a fan blade from the disc. The engine has to contain the fan blade safely and also has to contend successfully with the resulting out-of-balance forces. This is a technology in which Rolls-Royce has a clear lead over any other manufacturer. 
Nevertheless, the fan blade containment test is regarded as an essential demonstration of safety and integrity. A released fan blade contains enough energy to throw a medium-sized car some hundred feet into the air. In a full engine test, this energy is absorbed as vibration through the engine carcass, truly one of the most impressive sights in aero engine testing. But you may have also noticed that there's enormous vibrations when that fracture happens. You know, the engine was swinging about violently. And in that instant, you've got to regain some control on that engine and shut it down safely. Otherwise, the vibrations themselves can bring the aircraft down. And that's where the shaft comes in, because that massive steel shaft that you saw has to bend to accommodate the mismatch that you get when the blade comes off. So this shaft has to support enormous stresses and at the same time have the plasticity to bend and compensate for the imbalance that you get when a blade breaks off. And this is the size of uh, the shaft that goes straight through the engine and it's made as a composite material. So there are two, two parts to it. Uh, one part is for the hot end of the engine and for that you require different properties to the cooler end of the engine where you want the material to be able to absorb impact. Okay? Impact is, you know, if you hit a bit of glass it will shatter, whereas if you have uh, uh, plastic and you hit it, it won't shatter, it will absorb the energy. So we need two different capabilities. At the colder end of the engine, the material has to be able to absorb energy and on the other end, which is hot, you have to resist uh, creep. I will illustrate what creep deformation is. But first of all, I'll show you how this shaft is actually made as a composite material, because you've got to join these two different steels together. And there's a process which is known as uh, um, friction welding. So here you have two bits of metal, which uh, one is stationary, the other one is rotating, and you push them together until they touch, and the resulting friction creates a bond between the, those two. It's a metallurgically sound bond, and the excess material is pushed out, and you just machine it away. And just to watch that process happening is amazingly impressive. So they are friction welded together, and all this adds to the cost of manufacture and also you have to test the joint very rigorously to make sure that there are no uh, defects of any importance. So the idea was to manufacture a single shaft which covers both high temperature properties and low temperature properties and this is where we decided to create a new material. Now I need to explain very quickly what creep deformation is. So imagine that we have a, a specimen of steel and it's two centimeters in diameter. It's very easy. I can hang a one kilogram weight without any deformation happening. However, if the temperature is high, then atoms will diffuse inside the material. They move about in the material. And with time, the steel sample will get longer. And this is called creep deformation. And we've got to stop that because obviously we don't want dimensional changes going on inside our engine, which is, which is a precision engineered piece of kit. So the second property that we need is that the material must be able to absorb a sudden, sudden impact okay, um, without shattering. And that is a property that we call toughness. The material must be tough. So strength and toughness are two different parameters. Strength is how much load you can support for given service conditions. And toughness is the ability to absorb energy without fracture. Very important parameter. Uh, of course, we don't measure toughness as I've illustrated in this slide. Uh, the way in which you would do it is you have a sample of your metal 
with a notch in it to create a certain kind of stress system at the crack, at the tip of the notch. And then you give it a, a thump and measure the uh, energy absorbed. So here, for example, is a machine with which you would measure the amount of energy that the sample absorbs before fracture. And you want that energy to be as high as possible. That makes a good material. So toughness and creep resistance is what we are after. And this is a new uh, steel, a new iron alloy that we have designed, which has both of those properties. So there's no need actually to make a composite shaft. And notice that um, uh, you know, the creep scenario that I illustrated was a simple rod with a weight hanging on it. But a real shaft has many engineering features. Okay? For example, you, you see the splines that are machined in, which slots into the disc, which drives the actual um, turbine blades. So there are many engineering features built into the shaft which provide all kinds of stress concentrations and problems and so on so when i say that i'm looking for two properties like the creep property and the toughness actually there's a whole bank of properties that we have to optimize and you do that by talking to engineers and thinking about what are the actual requirements and then you try and design a material so that the entire bank of properties is satisfied if you don't do that initial bit of talking, then in your research, very quickly you run against problems because you're not matching the engineering requirements. So work like this takes a whole team of people, not, not simply material scientists or engineers, there's accountants as well, because you, know, you have to have your costs right. Now, I'm going to explain to you how strong that material is. And it's very easy to talk about numbers without actually thinking how that level of strength would feel. Now, strength is measured in a unit called Pascal, right? And Pascal is uh, a weight of one, uh, a force of one Newton spread over one square meter. And it turns out to be the case that an apple is approximately uh, one Newton in weight. So if I put it onto one square meter, then that's putting a stress of one Pascal. This new material has a strength of two gigapascals. That means you could pile two billion apples on one square meter. So it's incredibly strong. And uh, I'll give you just some numbers to uh, think about. So it's got a strength of 2.1 gigapascals, that 2.1 billion apples on one square meter. And even at 550 degrees centigrade, you can support 1.4 gigapascals, which is a massive stress to support. And I mentioned to you that we have a bank of properties to support. So generally speaking, when you have cyclic stresses, there's another phenomenon which comes in, which is known as fatigue. So steadily you know cracks might develop in your material and grow slowly over a period of time and that's known as fatigue it's a very good descriptive term uh, it basically means that your material becomes tired over time and of course uh, we are going to operate at high temperatures so we need thermal stability in whatever we design because temperature can ch cause changes in the structure of your material Okay, so to cut a long story short, uh, I want to show you what this material looks like on an atomic scale, right? And this is a, an instrument uh, which was built by Bob Waugh in which we can see individual atoms. And not only that, but we can pull an individual atom out and measure how long it takes to fly between two points and therefore identify the composition of that single atom uniquely. So that's called time of flight mass spectroscopy. So we can see individual atoms and in the figure on the right, each dot represents a single atom. And we can also form an image with particular species of atoms. So for example, in the lowest diagram that you see, I'm showing oxygen atoms, which are segregated at a boundary between crystals. <coughs> so this technique, uh, 
when Bob Wall built this instrument, he made it himself. Okay? But now you can buy these instruments commercially uh, and are very easy to use. So when, uh, when I was working with him, we collected about a million atoms in a period of a week. Now you can do that in a few seconds. So, for the new material that we've developed, the new iron alloy, uh, look at the scale over there. We are looking at each dot representing a single atom. And we have got a number of different elements inside our material. Uh, and you can see that there are variations in composition across the um, image. And those are incredibly small engineered particles inside our steel. Uh, introduced by heat treatment, which prevent that creep deformation, the steady lengthening of the material at high temperatures when it's under stress. And you can see that the number density of particles is huge, and that is why it is so strong even at very high temperatures. But the other thing to note is that if we actually put large particles inside our material, then they will lead to fracture, okay? Some sort of fracture in your material under stress. But these particles are incredibly small. Okay? A, a nanometer is, is a, a billionth of a meter in size. So when you have very fine particles, you don't compromise the ability of the material to absorb energy on impact. And that's why we have a good combination of toughness and of creep strength. This is the final machined shaft. You can see there are many, many engineering features along its length. And it has been in a test engine. And we have a US patent uh, and a European patent granted for this material. But you know, when uh, that patent was in 2015, generally, uh, you have to not only have um, uh, a patent for your material, but also for all the engineering that goes behind the creation of the shaft. So there are many different techniques used for machining this shaft and uh, various other aspects. So you file a whole series of patents to protect your technology. And the second patent was filed in 2019 and granted in 2021, that's last year. And in that way, you make sure that your competitors, you know, they can either license your technology, which you've spent time and money developing the product, or uh, they can't use it. And you have a competitive advantage in your um, technology. Okay, so going back to this thermodynamic efficiency. You know, in the old days, the efficiency of a steam turbine used for generating electricity was of the order of 40% because the steam temperatures were around 550 degrees centigrade. Nowadays, routinely, steam temperatures are of the order of 600 degrees centigrade, but we want to go even higher. We want a steam temperature of 750 degrees centigrade. And for that, there are no materials because the requirements for a steam turbine are completely different from those of a jet engine. Because first of all, look at the scale of this object, okay? It is huge. Uh, it is not only huge, but there are different materials along its uh, length. And the service life of this is of the order of 40 years, whereas a jet engine would last for around 40,000 hours. You know, uh, uh, one year is about eight and a half thousand hours. So. Jet engines, of course, are not operating all the time. So in terms of the life, in terms of years, it's, it's long, but in terms of service life, it's only about 40,000 hours. This has to last for more than uh, 40 years. And just to illustrate the scale again, this is uh, my uh, PhD student, Tracy Cool, standing next to the turbine. And I think she is about five feet, uh, uh, five, um, five feet, eight inches tall. So these are huge objects rotating rapidly. And if there is a fracture in this, it can destroy the entire building, okay? 
And if you go to the um, uh, Tate Modern Gallery, which used to be a power station, you can see the size of the turbine hole. It's huge. And of course, there are other components which have to match those steam temperatures. So these, for example, are the pipes which feed the steam into the turbine and, and so on. So there is enormous technology that goes into a steam turbine generator and we want the steam temperature to be 750 degrees centigrade. Now, the materials we have at the moment simply cannot cope with that, okay? Full stop, they cannot cope with that. So we were tasked to develop a new material <coughs> which can survive the 40 years of service life and with a steam temperature of 750 degrees centigrade. Now, I told you that in the jet engine, you know, the blades are operating at, in an environment which is at 1500 degrees C. So what's the problem? Why can't we just take those materials and put them in the um, steam turbine? Well, the alloys that we have in the jet engine are incredibly expensive, okay? Incredibly expensive. So if you take a blade, its value is worth more than its weight in silver. Okay? So you cannot possibly make huge engineering structures using those alloys. But we don't want to use those alloys at 1500 degrees centigrade. We simply want to go to 750 degrees centigrade. So we can remove many of the expensive additions that we make to jet turbine alloys and re-engineer the material so that it performs at 750 degrees centigrade. Now, the trouble is, you know, the number of variables involved in designing a material is huge. Okay, so I've, I've got a conservative list over here where we can throw in basically anything from the periodic table, and then there is all the processing, the joining, and various heat treatments. So it's a very complicated problem. And we don't have all the theory <coughs> that is necessary to predict the various properties that I illustrated earlier. So what do we do? Well, we use mathematical models as far as we can. Okay? But then we go into something known as machine learning. And the power of machine learning is that we can have any number of variables and any level of complexity. The method actually thrives when you have really complicated problems for which the science is not yet ready. And I illustrated to you that there are many, many variables in play. And if you ignore some of those variables, you know, that is the normal way of science that you reduce the problem, then you actually lose the technology. And I'll illustrate that. So here is a plot uh, of uh, Y versus X, and these points look pretty random. But if I introduce two more variables which control this variable Y, and that one of them is the Z axis pointing out of the plane of the diagram, and the other is time, then you see that the picture immediately becomes clear as to what this is. So ignoring variables and simplifying the problem, which is the normal method of science, doesn't work when you want to do complicated things. Uh, so machine learning comes into play when that happens. And a very simple explanation of machine learning is that it's a completely empirical method, just like uh, regression, linear regression analysis, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, but we can make this highly nonlinear, right? As nonlinear as we like. And the shape of the mathematical functions can change dramatically uh, with the parameters that we put in. So this is, this is a, a, a simple form of a machine learning algorithm where you can see the surface is quite complicated. And we only have two variables here. So imagine that if you have a hundred variables, how complex this surface can be. Now, there is a problem with having a very complex surface. You can make it pass through every single point, even though your data may be noisy. So I've got a sequence of numbers here, 
two, four, six, and eight, and I want to illustrate to you a problem. Can somebody tell me what the next two numbers in this sequence should be? And speak loudly. Yep, so 10 and 12, okay? That's a, a perfectly reasonable answer because, you know, we tend to think linearly, okay? Now, I can have that same sequence but use a different equation here. So if I plug in eight into X, then I will get 8.91. If I plug in six into X, I will get exactly eight. If I plug in four, I will get exactly six. And if I plug in two, I will get exactly four. But going beyond that, you know, I have different extrapolation. So we are using a completely empirical method. And therefore, we don't know whether the linear function or the nonlinear function is correct. Yeah, we only have experimental data going from two, four, six, and eight. So these are two functions which exactly represent known knowledge, right? what we know. But they behave differently as soon as you extrapolate. And remember that we are interested in extrapolation. We don't want to just do things which we know. Right? We want to create new materials. So this is what we call a modeling error. So you have two different models which accurately represent the known data, but which behave differently. And you have to think about whether there is a physical reason for having this function or this function. And that's where your scientific intuition comes in. So that's one problem. <clears throat> okay? And we designed this uh, alloy, this new alloy, using machine learning in combination with thermodynamics and kinetics and various other things. But machine learning was very powerful in estimating the mechanical properties because you know we can't wait to test the material for 10 years before putting it into, into service we've got to move faster than that and this is what the material looks like in a transmission electron microscope uh, we have certain features which i won't go into in any detail but it's designed to stop creep over a period of 40 years and it's, a, it's got a very simple composition. And we call this alloy FT750DC. Now FT is after Frank Tonkre, who was my postdoc, who did the work. 750 is for the steam temperature in centigrade. And DC is dirt cheap. This is designed to be a cheap alloy, which you can make in huge quantities and uh, make a steam turbine. And the dashed lines over there show you our machine learning predictions. And when we did the experiments, you can see that we get agreement within the modeling uncertainty, right? So that's the strength. And that is the creep resistance that I illustrated to you earlier. And of course, the tests have been going on continuously, but we've reached, um, the, the standard that you use is 100,000 hours of testing. Okay? That's when your creep data become reliable. Because if you do short-term tests using excessively high loads, then that may not represent the physical mechanisms of creep that happen at low stresses. So we reached uh, more than 100,000 hours of this. And using the same methods, we have made predictions for the fusion reactor program. Now, for the fusion reactor program, the problem is different. We are not interested in creep so much as in neutron damage. Because in the fusion reaction, you create neutrons which have much higher energy than in fission reactors. And furthermore, the dose of neutrons is higher. So typically in a, a normal reactor, a fission reactor, you would have 30 displacements of every atom in your material over the service life. With a fusion reactor, we expect 200 displacements per atom in your material. Now imagine the pain the material is feeling, you know, when the neutrons knock every atom out of position 200 times. So that changes the structure of the metal in two ways. First of all, it introduces lots and lots of defects which compromise the properties. 
But secondly, it creates, by transmutation, it creates other elements inside your material. And <clears throat> you do not want to create elements which have a long half-life in terms of radioactivity, because we don't want to clear, create nuclear waste. So the great thing about the fusion reactor is that if anything breaks, you know, it just shuts down automatically because the plasma has to be at 10 million degrees Kelvin or more. Uh, so we don't want to create nuclear waste. So there are many elements in the periodic table which you can rule out as additions to your material because they transmute into high half-life radioactive elements. So we use machine learning to make predictions for the levels of damage to expect inside the steels which would be used to construct this reactor. So I don't know if you know this, but the longest ever burn in the fusion reactor, okay, which is about six seconds, was achieved in Britain just a few days ago. So we are on the way towards commercial production using fusion processes because there's a massive reactor being built, an international collaboration uh, to take this technology forward. And there's even a commercial company in Britain which is making its own fusion reactor. And the key physics problems are solved. The key materials problems remain. So, I've mentioned to you the power of machine learning, and I want you to think a little bit more. You know, there are many, many terms being used for this. Uh, it's essentially an empirical method, but people call it artificial intelligence. So, is this actually intelligent at all? Or is it just a bit of mathematics? And I was interviewing a, a sort of a biologist who works on intelligence. The main uh, aspect of her research is to look at very simple creatures and how they perceive uh, intelligence. So episodic memory, for example, is if this creature sees another creature and then sometime later sees it again, does it remember that it has seen that creature, right? And also, does it plan the future? Does it actually migrate towards that creature to meet it again? Or, or go towards a particular food source. So I'm not putting up a comprehensive list of the definition of intelligence that she came up with, but these two are key features. And I don't think that machine learning can be classified as intelligent in that sense. Uh, the second uh, aspect I want you to think about is if you invert this problem, right? We think we are intelligent, all right, and that we have a consciousness. Is that simply a reflection of complicated computing, empirical computing that goes on in our brain that we don't understand at the moment, so we call it something like consciousness? Or is it something special? So there is this uh, book I would recommend to you by Anil Sat at Sussex University. I just want to finish off with a slide explaining what material science really is. You know, it is basically the most interdisciplinary subject that you can find in any of the sciences or technologies. We cover any aspect of chemistry, physics, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, you name it, right? And, you know, Colin Stoke next will be on device materials. I've already explained to you the physical metallurgy concepts. There's also materials chemistry, you know, the invention of new batteries and, and, and uh, corrosion and so forth. We have polymers, ceramics and composites, and of course, biological material, biomaterials. And there are two themes which go across all of these subjects, okay, completely common to both of these subjects. And one of them is uh, highly experimental, very clever experiments and the other one is quantitative. So <clears throat> we use characterization methods all the way from atoms to engineering scales. So for example, we were designing a particular beam for a building. So we had to put up a building and set it on fire to prove 
that it would actually survive for one year and allow the occupants to escape. So the characterization isn't just looking at atoms, but going across the land scales. The second thing is the quantitative methods that we are developing are getting to a really exciting stage where you can make estimates. And I, I, I say estimates because there will always be uncertainties associated with them. And that's where, where you know, the challenge of characterization comes in. And I think that now we are in a position where we can get to what's known as a technology readiness level of six in a period of about three years. Okay. And then there is, of course, a manufacturing readiness level as well. So things have changed dramatically since the days of, if you like, bucket chemistry, where you try something out and hope that it works. <clears throat> 